right, welcome everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I am delighted to welcome you all here. I'm Cassidy Sugimoto. I'm the chair of the School of Public Policy at Georgia Tech. And I am absolutely delighted to be joined today by our talented presenters to discuss disrupting the status quo or perpetuating inequalities. When we were designing MetaScience 2021, it was clear that we wanted to have a session that would focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And recognizing the methodological angle of the conference, we decided to go with a session that would present some of the state-of-the-art techniques in incorporating DEI variables into large-scale studies. I want to make a note that these talks are not meant to be exhaustive or even comprehensive. Rather, the goal is to present a particular approach that allows us to center our discussion about advances in research in our field and where we can go, future directions. Um, I want to mention a few things. We take as our starting assumption that contemporary scientific practices are not value-free and perpetuate several systemic biases in science and society. We also acknowledge that our data remains embedded in categorizations and taxonomies that reinforce problematic racial and gender categories that may be exclusionary. What we hope to do today is to demonstrate some empirical studies in this area to begin to interrogate our current approaches and to create some new ones. So to do that, we call upon you as our audience to engage. We've organized this event to allow ample time for you to question, to critique, and to imagine. We will do short presentations with focus questions from you after each and then turn to a general panel and discussion. While I have some questions prepared, I would ideally like to focus entirely on your questions. So use the chat function early and use it often. Um, side conversations are not only allowable, they are encouraged. So with that preamble, it is my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Danny Bassett, a named professor of bioengineering with a secondary appointment in physics and astronomy at the University of Pennsylvania. They received a BS in physics from Penn State and a PhD in physics from the University of Cambridge as a Churchill Scholar and as an NIH Health Sciences Scholar. They then did a postdoc at UC Santa Barbara and a junior research fellow at the SAGE Center for the Study of the Mind. The American Psychological Association called them a rising star in 2012, and they have certainly lived up to that label, becoming a Sloan Research Fellow, MacArthur Genius, Office of Naval Research Young Investigator, NSF Career Awardee, and more recently, um, an Erdos Renyi Prize Awardee. Their publication record is an expression of their industry and insatiable curiosity. So I'm delighted that they brought their skills as a neural and systems engineer to study disparities in science. Dr. Bassett, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for the very kind introduction. I'm really excited to be with you all here today and also just wanted to underscore what Cassidy said about um, being excited about the conversation um, and how to uh, engage in this work even better in the future. So the title of my talk today is Racial, Ethnic, and Gender Imbalances in Reference Lists in Scientific Papers. And as we all know, um, gender and racial inequalities are pervasive in academia as well as in industry. They have been reported in compensation, in grant funding, in credit for collaborative work, in teaching evaluations, in hiring and promotion, and in productivity and authorship. What's really interesting about the conversation around these inequalities is that most of the conversation still focuses largely on the role of people in positions of power, such as journal editors or grant reviewers and agencies or department chairs or society presidents. And that's interesting because many of the imbalances are in fact caused and perpetuated by researchers at all levels. Um, and this, this uh, particular, in, you know, systemic uh, imbalance is something that holds true for citations, which is going to be the focus of my talk today. So citations um, uh, are a really interesting and multifaceted um, object. The uh, Sarah Ahmed is a um, fantastic scholar who focuses on um, diversity work across academia, and she refers to citations as academic bricks. And there are sort of at least two ways in which citations are academic bricks. They are first the basic building blocks of academic careers. So they are the building blocks of success, of compensation, of promotion, of grant and other funding awards, of collaborative opportunities, and of speaking invitations even if we would hope that citations were not so influential, the fact is that they actually very much are. Um, but citations are also the basic building blocks of whole fields of inquiry. So citations map 
scholarly fields. They define spaces of inquiry and spaces of non-inquiry. They determine the scope of questions considered and the scope of questions that are not considered. Um, and they record a history of scientific ideas. And I, and I am careful to say not the history, not necessarily the true history, but they record a history of scientific ideas. So as academic bricks then, citations can build a more diverse scientific community or they can erect walls of exclusion. So we wanted to study citations and specifically understand whether we cite equitably or instead with clear preferences for a given gender, race, or ethnicity. And in the first study, um, we uh, collaborated with a range of scientists, statisticians, um, a physicist, and a professor who works in gender and race theory. Our approach was to examine the authors and reference lists of 61,000 articles published since 1995 in top uh, five top neuroscience journals. Um, physics is coming shortly. These journals was, were reported by the Web of Science to have the highest eigenvector scores in the field. What we did next was to assign the term man or the term woman to each author if their name had a probability greater than or equal to 0.7 of belonging to someone labeled as a man or a woman in the Social Security Administration database or in the gender API. Um, in our analysis, then, there are some important limitations, and I want to put them up front here. So the term gender, then, in our analysis really refers to the genderedness of a name. It does not directly refer to the sex of the author as assigned at birth or chosen later, nor does it refer directly to the gender of the author as socially assigned or as self-chosen. Second, I want to mention that this binary man, woman, gender assignment is not well accommodated to intersex, transgender, and or non-binary identities. We have some ideas of ways to um, engage with those communities further, um, and I'd be happy to talk more about that in the question and answer period. So first, just to set the stage of the genders of authors over time. So here on the left side, we have um, the proportions of papers written by different author categories in 1995, and then up through to 2018. So what we found is that the proportion of articles with a woman as first or last author significantly increased between 1995 and 2018 at a rate of roughly 0.6 percentage points per year. Now with that data, we wanted to test three hypotheses. The first hypothesis, hypothesis is a general undercitation of women. So for each of 31,418 citing papers between 2009 and 2018, we took the subset of its citations that had been published in one of those top five journals since 1995 and determined the uh, predicted gender of the cited first and last authors. These uh, two author um, positions are quite important um, in neuroscience. Note that we also removed self citations um, and those are defined as cited papers for which either the first or last author of the citing paper was also the first or last author. That allowed us to calculate the number of cited papers that fell um, into each, oh, sorry, into each of the four first author and last author categories, man, man, woman, man, man, woman, and woman, woman. So next, in order to determine whether um, any particular group is being oversighted or undersighted, we have to have an understanding of how many citations a paper is expected to receive. So to obtain that number of expected um, citations, we used at first a random draws approach where we calculated the gender proportions among all papers published prior to the citing paper. So that represents the proportion among this whole pool of papers that the authors could have cited. And we multiplied that by the number of papers that the authors cited. So with this definition of the expected proportion, we can then determine over and under citation as the observed percent minus the expected percent divided by the expected percent. What we find is that the MM papers are oversighted by 11% and the uh, woman woman papers are undersighted by 30.2% for a difference of over 40 percentage points. Now you might say that when you um, place references inside of your um, citation list, you don't randomly draw from the literature and that is absolutely true. So we followed up that initial analysis with a second assessment of expected citation count that 
um, accounts for additional paper characteristics. So for example, the year of publication, um, the journal in which it was published. So some journals have higher impact factors and perhaps papers in that journal will tend to be cited more. The number of authors on the paper, whether the paper was a review article or a um, empirical paper. And we did that because review articles are typically cited more frequently um, than empirical papers. And then fifth, the seniority of the paper's first and last authors. Now, I'll note that we don't have precise ages for the authors in our study. Um, so we used as a proxy, the number of papers that that person had previously published. So that sort of productivity mark was a um, uh, estimate of their seniority. Then we specified a generalized additive model on the multinomial outcome of paper authorship in those same four author categories. And we found again that the man-man papers are oversighted by 5.2% and the women-women papers are undersighted by 13.9% for a total of about 20 percentage points as difference. Our next hypothesis was that that undercitation would be driven by a, the majority group. And you'll see this here for gender and later for race and ethnicity where the majority group is white. Um, so here, what you can see is the citing practices of the man-man teams. So along the y-axis here is percent over and under citation. And along the x-axis are the four author categories. And what you can see again is that for um, the man-man teams, uh, they tend to oversight other man-man papers and undersight the women-women papers. Whereas if you look at the citing practices of papers that have a woman either in the first or the last author category or both, you see that they cite very close to the zero line. So are very um, close to that expected. Now, the third hypothesis that we wanted to test was that these effects should be decreasing with time. We're optimists here, um, and we expected that given the fact that there's a growing diversity in academia, we should see that the undercitation of minority groups should decrease with time. But what we actually found is that the imbalance within these reference lists is increasing with time, contrary to our hypothesis. And that's particularly true in the papers authored um, with a man in the first and last position. So here you see along the y-axis, the percent over and under citation for um, papers that have a man in the first and last position. So you can see they increasingly cite man-man papers over time and decreasingly cite woman-woman papers over time. I'll forecast in a few minutes, you're going to see the same same effect in race, where the majority race is increasingly citing their own race. Um, and on, on the right hand side here, you see the same um, plot, but now for the citing practices of papers that have a woman in either the first or the last author position. So here you can see that there's a slight widening um, of the citation gap in this group, but it's significantly less than what you see in the man-man papers. So now we can ask the question of, you know, what other dimensions of difference might these kinds of um, disparities arise? And the obvious next one to check is race and ethnicity. And um, I'll note that the first uh, group of individuals who did the gender study um, were, uh, was a relatively small and not racially or ethnic diverse group. And so in addressing this um, second question, we really broadened our team significantly and we're very grateful for all of the individuals who provided their additional expertise um, and their experiences in crafting the narrative around um, these results. So um, for race and ethnicity, what we did is that we assigned the author race and ethnicity um, using again, publicly available probabilistic databases and a deep neural network that learns the relationship between names and racial or ethnic categories in um, voter registration data, US census data and Wikipedia entries. Note that the voter and census, uh, the voter registration and census data are US centric, um, whereas Wikipedia is quite international. The approach then allows us to estimate the probability distribution across four racial ethnic categories, so Asian, Black, Hispanic, and White, um, based on each author's first and last names. What I'll show you for the next few slides, though, collapses all of that data into either white authors or authors of color. So across the 63,000 articles, the proportion of articles with a person of color as either first or last author significantly increased from 1995 to 2019 at a rate of roughly 0.49% per year. So that's the good news. 
Um, the bad news is that the authors of color are consistently undersighted in comparison to both the random draws model and the paper characteristics model. So here's the random draws model, just so that I can parallel what I showed you in the gender study. So here um, along the y-axis is the percent over under citation, and along the x-axis is the four author categories. So white, 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 color, color, white, and then author of color, author of color. What you can see is that the expected citation counts are in these light, um, unsaturated um, violin plots, and then the true data are in the saturated colored uh, violin plots. So you can see that white, white papers are being significantly oversighted by about 8%, and author of color, author of color papers are being undersighted by 17.2% for a difference of about 25%. Note that the white citers are driving the majority of this effect. So white people like me are oversighting other white white papers by about 12% and undersighting author of color papers by 24%. Citers of color, on the other hand, are citing much closer to the zero line, so much closer to um, parity or equality. So they're citing oversighting white papers by 4.3% and undersighting author of color papers by 8%. Now, moving beyond the random draws model and accounting for these additional characteristics of papers that might be important or might be explanatory, separate from um, race or ethnicity, we included now the year of publication, the journal of publication, the number of authors, whether it was a research article or review article, the first and last author seniority. And in this case, we added a sixth factor, which is the location of the author's institution. Now, according to this model, again, you see you know, the same effects. So um, over everybody, the white white papers are being oversighted by 5%, the author of color, author of color papers are being undersighted by 9.3%, and the majority of that effect is being driven by white citers who cite other white white papers by 7% and undersight author of color papers by 14%. Again, citers of color are citing closer to the zero line. Now, is the racial and ethnic imbalance in citations increasing or decreasing with time? What we see is that this also is increasing with time, although at a slower rate than we saw in gender. So here along the y-axis is the percent over and under citation again, and then the x-axis is time. And what you can see is that white citers are over citing white white papers increasingly with time. So this purple slope is sloping upwards, whereas they're citing author of color papers less and less with time, and that's the burnt orange color going down. Citers of color, as you can see, again, are, are citing closer to the zero line, but you can still see um, a widening gap, although to a much lesser extent than what you see in the white citers. So just as a quick pictorial summary, well, it's actually a data summary, it's a summary of intersectionality, which is what happens when we um, account for not just um, the predicted race or ethnicity of the person based on their name, but also the um, gender of the person based on their name. What we find, so here along the y-axis is the first author, race, um, ethnicity, and gender, and then along the x-axis is the same information for the last author. The color indicates over citation in red and under citation citation in blue. Just a quick sort of, you know, bird's eye view of this figure shows you that there's a clear demarcation by gender with the man-man papers, which are in the top left quadrant being in general oversighted, and the woman-woman papers in the bottom right quadrant being in general undersighted. But even within those gender bins, you can see um, a parameterization by race. And I wanted to call out in particular the endpoints. So black women being undersighted by 47% and white men being oversighted by 24% for a difference of about 70%. And again, these effects are being largely driven by the majority race and the majority gender and are increasing with time. So obviously, um, that's a sort of a um, downer. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, it's important to think of what we can do. And I think what we can do is to attempt to do science better. I like to quote Maya Angelou in saying, the truth is no one of us can be free until everybody is free. And I think all of us want everybody to be free. Um, so one of the things that we have chosen to do and, and encourage others to do is to just check and fix your own reference lists as you're writing papers so that um, none of us contribute to an ongoing imbalance um, in these citation practices. And there's code available that we've developed. Feel free to use it. We'd love to know about bugs, et cetera. 
Um, number two, append a citation diversity statement in your paper. Um, that uh, is a way of increasing awareness about um, this disparity and of also holding ourselves accountable to one another. And if you'd like uh, to read a, a paper perspective on that, we have just recently published one in um, 2020. And lastly, um, consider you know, contributing to this field by bringing more um, inequality to light and developing more mitigation tools. For example, um, there is a citation transparency uh, code available from the Chrome Web Store. And um, tools like that can be very useful for helping us to um, further this work. So with that, I'd like to say thanks. I think we have maybe a few minutes for questions before turning to the next speaker. Uh, Cassidy can, can say thank you. Thank you so much, Annie. I am so impressed with the robustness of your work, and it is just very important work, as noted by uh, people in the chat already who utilized it both in their own research and in, in translations to practice. There are a few questions, so I will move through those. Um, the first comes from Rose Franzen, who asked, what impact, if any, do you think that the underrepresentation and undercounting of people of color in voter records and census data had on the neural network and learning names and resultingly the analyses of the names and citations? Yeah, that's a really, really great question. Um, so I think that for the voter registration and the census data, um, there is an underrepresentation of people from um, an equal, there is not an equal representation of people from these um, racial and ethnic categories. For the Wikipedia data, though, I would say that, that the representation is much better. I will note that there is one group of individuals for whom um, the predictions are not particularly good, and those are um, Black individuals in the United States who have um, names that have come uh, through that are sort of Anglican names that have come from the history of slavery, um, from the people um, that they were um, enslaved with. And so that's something, that's a group of individuals for whom you know, the predictions are poor. And that's something that we all have to live with in the sort of history of, of that country, my country, unfortunately. And sort of related to that, but on the gender space, one attendee asked about unisex names, noting that this applies to many Sikh names. Can you address this and how the unknowns in gender might be unequally distributed across the population? Yeah, that's a really great question. So there is a percentage of um, names for whom we cannot assign a gender so that their names don't pass the 0.7 mark. So they would, they would be called unknown in our um, data. At the moment, we just focus on the names that are known, um, but are in the sense that they are gendered enough to cross that threshold. But I think that um, that means that the results that we find are really uh, name-based biases that are evident um, in the languages and communities in, in which names are quite gendered. For um, language and, and communities in which names are less gendered, I think there need to be different sorts of tools and different sorts of analyses um, to uncover these same kinds of um, discriminatory patterns. And a follow-up question, what is the distribution of unknown gender names across races? Is this a limitation that is in the paper? Um, we don't have the, that's easy to find, it's not in the paper, but we have not, um, but that's easy to do, so I'd be happy to follow up on that. And maybe one last question before we move over from Dominique Roche, who wrote that these results are really interesting and worrying, and I agree. Um, is there any experimental evidence that authors actively investigate the gender of authors of the papers they cite? For example, first names are not always indicated on PDFs or even on journal web pages. So determining an author's gender or inferring an author's gender requires an extra step of looking them up online. Could it be that men tend to cite other men because they know them and are familiar with them, whereas women tend to cite authors with whom they're not necessarily familiar? That is such a good question. Um, so uh, after 2006, many journals switched to using first names. And so those are more and more um, available for most journals in, in the newer work. Um, but before 2006, it was not as common. Um, so uh, predicting names in that sense in, or predicting genders for those older papers probably came from knowing that person um, or from uh, 
other people suggesting that work for you to read. But for the, anything past 2006, um, most of the, the journals um, are including first names now. So the second question is, you know, is it that people, do you look people up online? Um, I think that uh, certainly that's something that we are doing to increase our um, knowledge about and our ability to cite other individuals who may not identify as a woman or as a man, um, or who identify as um, a trans woman or a trans man who may not be in the cis categories that we would um, be uh, thinking about more typically. So that's uh, something that we are actively using as a positive um, action that we can take. And Andrew, Miles also followed up and said, also curious about the mechanisms. Can we know, effectively, can we know that this is some form of implicit bias or are there other correlative effects that may be driving some of these things, such as networks, relationships, um, et cetera, that we might be able to control for? That's such a really, that's another really good question. So some of the data that I was not able to go through today because of the time, um, but is included in both of those papers is that social networks do play a role and do account for some of the variance um, in these patterns. There's still variance left unexplained, um, but there is a significant amount of variance that is explained by co-authorship patterns. So if there is a person um, nearby in your co-authorship network, you tend to cite them. There's also significant gender and race-based homophily in co-authorship networks. And so um, it's possible for somebody to be in a, in a group that is um, mostly a majority gender and mostly a majority race and cite those individuals. Um, so uh, I do think that, that driving changes in the social network and in co-authorship networks could be a, a great potential um, mitigation tool. And I said one more, but I'm going to ask you one more. <laughs> um, so David Bernard said, are you able to see any difference in trends pre and post this journal's policy change in 2006? Um, just in right now, just a change in the number of authors that we can um, assign a predicted gender, um, but we don't, that's, that's all we have. Fantastic. All right, I'd like everyone to join me in a proverbial hand clapping and gratitude uh, for Danny being here and sharing her expertise. We're gonna come back to you, Danny, but for a moment, we're going to turn over um, to Diego. Uh, Diego Kozlowski is a PhD candidate at the doctoral training unit in data-driven computational modeling at the University of Luxembourg. His work focuses on implementing computational methods to answer questions in social science, particularly in science of science. He's an economist by training with a degree from the University of Buenos Aires and a master's degree from the same institution in data mining and knowledge discovery. He has been taking his skills in data mining to study inequities, which he will present here. Diego, take it away. Thanks, Cassidy, for the introduction. And thanks, Danny, for the presentation. I think it was uh, really, really great. Uh, I'm really happy to be here with all of you. Uh, so today I'm going to present a, a research project uh, called Intersectional Inequalities in Science. And uh, first, I'm also going to talk a little bit about the name-based racial inference, as Danny did also, um, but with a different approach. Then I'm going to use those conclusions to uh, apply this, this emulation to uh, authors in US and maybe if the time allows a, a little case example. So uh, Suberi says that the racialization of data is an artifact of both the struggles to preserve and to destroy racial stratification. In our study, we want to uh, understand how, how the cultural construct of race in US uh, influence US academy and generates inequalities. But our bibliometric databases, namely Web of Science, don't have all information of author self-perceived race. So uh, we have to first make an inference on this, uh, on the information that we have that in this case is uh, names as Danny was explaining. But also this was mentioned uh, before, this can introduce new biases in the, the algorithms for racial uh, inference or trying to assign a racial category can generate new biases and can underestimate populations. So first we want to focus on how can we make the most um, possibly unbiased uh, methods for this. So an author uh, since 2008 
can uh, in, in the web of science has uh, most most of them have a given a family name and each of these names can be assigned to a probability distribution over the categories from the census and where given names in our case are coming from information on mortgage applications and family names from the US census in a, if our goal is to assign a single label uh, to this means assigning a single racial category to an author, then uh, we have two things to consider. First is which of these probabilities or a combination of these probabilities to use. And then a, an assignation mechanism, a, for example, a threshold. Then. So uh, let's say we have a Juan Li who has a certain distribution for his given name and for his family name. And uh, we want to use a 90% threshold and given names. So we would say that Juan is probably a Latinx author because uh, there is uh, more than 90% of probability of uh, be associated with the name Juan to be a uh, self-perceived as Latinx. While if we want to use the family names, the Lee uh, family name is partially associated with Asian population, partially associated with white population, and partially associated with black population, and therefore we won't be able uh, to assign it to any of these categories. So with this general framework, we define several different models uh, and then compare them and see which one are uh, more or less biased. First, uh, we use family names, then given names, then a mixture of both distributions. And also, as I was saying before, the information on given names comes from the mortgage application data that has a very different underlying distribution and specifically, particularly bias uh, towards white population. So therefore we also build these same models using a normalized version of the distribution of given names that matches on the aggregate level, the one on the census. But we can also abandon our uh, first original idea of assigning a single category and instead use fractional counting, uh, which means that we are not going to uniquely identify an author with a single group, but rather we are going to use the full distribution of probability. And on the aggregate level, we are going to sum each of those probabilities. In this way, uh, we are going to get uh, the most unbiased result, specifically if we use the family names that come from the census information. So in this example here, we are uh, using a 90% threshold in uh, authors in Web of Science. And uh, the first uh, column is the fractional accounting. This means it doesn't use any threshold at all. And it's specifically for uh, information from the census. And that's what we consider our gold standard because it's the best information uh, that we have available. And all the rest are all the different combinations of models that we uh, tried. And we can see that in all cases, the black population is heavily underestimated. Is, and while for almost all the models, the Latinx population is also underestimated. And this is something that uh, Danny was explaining before. These models particularly uh, are uh, working bad for, for an, uh, underestimating the black population. And this is related to the history of slavery and how the naming practices in US uh, are made. If we try to use a different threshold, we will see that we have more or less the same reasons. In this case, we are showing the ratio between the fractional counting and uh, all the different models. So the one there is, uh, it means the same numbers we would get with the uh, fractional counting. And we can see that all models are heavily underestimating the black population, and almost all models are heavily underestimating the Latin X population. So um, also on a partially different conclusion, um, what happens on web of science, even when we are restricting our analysis to US, uh, still there are many names that uh, are missing from the census data. So we want to impute them somehow, somehow to, to avoid losing that information. And there we find ourselves with uh, different possibilities. One is to use the US census aggregate. This means the general distribution on the census. The other possibility is use this special category that appears on the data on family names, that is all other names. 
But then we compare it with the fractional counting performed on US uh, web, uh, web of science offers uh, for those names that we do know. And we can see that the underlying distribution is very different because the distribution of US authors is very different from the distribution on the census. And therefore, we will be performing uh, other types of biases. In this case, uh, underestimating the Asian population. So the conclusion for us is not to use uh, these special categories from the census. So in summary, uh, our recommendations or our conclusions here are that we should use family names instead of given names, if, especially if they are coming from mortgage data. Maybe we didn't try the information on the voter's registration. Maybe there is a less biased uh, source of information there. Also, uh, that fractional counting is the best approximation rather than using thresholding, and that we should impute by our own data. But I think the most important consideration here is that we should always consider the historical context of our data, because these racial categories that uh, I'm presenting here and that we are using in our work only make sense in US, uh, in contemporary US, because they are a product of this society. Taking these categories of Latinx offers, for example, to Latin America would not make any sense because everybody there is a Latinx uh, population, except, well, people that's migrating there, but I mean, it, it doesn't make any sense. And also naming practices are a product of society. And uh, as Danny was mentioning before, this goes all the way back to times of slavery in the US. So it's very important if we want to extend this uh, type of models to a different country, for example, to understand the historical context and how naming practices are made in these countries and the relation with the racial uh, categories that are existing in those places to uh, be able to find the potential biases in our algorithms. And also using a full distribution instead of uh, simply assigning a label, we understand that might generate complications and might be more difficult, uh, make more difficult analysis afterwards, but it's the only way we found uh, to have an unbiased uh, analysis. So now I'm going to present uh, the use of this fractional counting on US authors in Web of Science in between 2008 and 2018. And first, we are going to see the aggregate distributions. So in this figure, we are showing the census uh, information by race and gender. We are also using a gender disambiguation uh, algorithm from previous work. Uh, also, the distribution in Web of Science and using the NSA data on uh, PhD graduates and their nationality and resident status we are doing something like a proxy of US residents. And what we can see overall is that there is a no representation of white and Asian men. But also in the third plot, we can see that a large proportion of Asian authors are not US residents. So using the census would not be the perfect benchmark to define overrepresentation on this specific group. We can also see that women are underrepresented, that Black and Latinx authors are underrepresented, and that the intersection of Black and Latinx women uh, are the most underrepresented categories, uh, groups. If uh, we try to understand the distribution uh, over disciplines, we can see uh, in this figure the relative under and over representation of groups. And uh, we can see that uh, Latinx, Black, and white women tend to have a high correlation in the, their distribution over fields and tend to be more present in topics like health or psychology, while less uh, present in topics like physics and mathematics or engineering. We can also see uh, in the figure on the top the distribution of citations by race and gender. And uh, we can see in blue the regular citations, the, the traditional average citations by group. And we can see that there is a big gap in citations as uh, Danny was explaining before. And uh, we can also see here on the figure on the margin that the distribution of citations varies a lot by fields. So we use a normalized distribution, uh, normalized citations average and in red. And we can see that the gap does reduce, but it's still uh, is present. So, our goal now is to go deeper into the analysis between fields and distribution by fields and race and gender 
and we are going to go all the way to research topics, which would be something like micro fields. And for this, we focus in this case in the discipline of health. And we define 200 specific topics using a model from topic modeling, LDA. And then we uh, analyze the distribution by race and gender and of the average participation on each of these uh, specific topics. So this figure shows uh, on the vertical axis the per proportion of women on each topic. Each dot uh, is a topic. And on the horizontal axis for each of the four plots, the participation of each of the racial groups. So we can see uh, first in, in every figure that uh, women tend to publish more in topics related with nursing, pregnancy, and education. Uh, on the top right corner, we can see the, that Black authors tend to focus more on African-American studies and racial disparity studies. While uh, Latinx authors on the bottom uh, left corner uh, tend to focus more on Mexican and Latinx body studies, but also on the English-Spanish uh, relation and language issues. Finally, we can see on the top left corner that Asian authors has a, have a specific topic uh, related with uh, China, and that uh, white authors on the bottom right corner don't have any specific topic uh, in, in which they are more present. And the question now is, how does this relate with the citation gaps? So in this figure, we're again showing under and over representation. And in this case, for each of the 200 uh, research topics, and we are sorting these topics vertically by the participation of white men. So on the bottom, we have all those topics that uh, where white men are less present. And on the top, we have all those topics where they are overrepresented. And on the margin, we can see the distribution of the average citation uh, on each of these topics. And we can see that there is a positive correlation between the participation of white men and the uh, average number of citations on these topics. So this means that white men tend to do research on more highly cited topics. And also, we can see uh, that there is a clear gender pattern across research topics in the same way we were uh, showing before on disciplines, but now on this micro level in health. So does this imply that the citation gap is just a matter of distribution or, uh, along research topics? Well, not exactly. Because in this figure, we are showing uh, now the, each of these topics sorted by the average number of citations on the horizontal axis. So on the right, we have the highly cited topics. And on the left, we have the low cited topics. And each dot represents a specific race and gender and the average citations that they get on uh, each topic. And then we smooth these distributions using uh, lowest function. And uh, what we can see is that all those lines on the top represent uh, the different racial categories for men, while all those lines in the bottom represent uh, the different groups of women. And this implies that men tend to be more cited in both highly cited topics and less cited topics, while women tend to be uh, less cited in, in both groups. So this implies that there is both an intertopic and intratopic bias. So uh, in conclusion, there is an underrepresentation of uh, marginalized groups in the intersection of race and gender. These groups have specific research interests and therefore those uh, specific research interests that mostly affect them uh, are understudied by science. And also, we saw that women tend to be less cited. And this is due to both the field and topic distribution and within topic bias. So uh, I have also a case example. I don't know, Cassidy, if we are fine with time. Maybe I can continue. Yeah? Yes, please. OK. So as I was saying, there, is a, there are relevant understudied topics in science. And these topics mainly affect marginalized groups. And this can appear uh, under the form of missing data sets. And I really like a quote from the authors on data feminisms uh, that says that the things that we do not or cannot collect data about are very often perceived to be things that do not exist, they exist at all. So 
the question is how can we make evidence-based policy over these topics if we are not studying them if the data of uh, for which uh, we can understand them is not there so for that i'm going to present a case example of how can we do it and it's uh, on data on abortion in clandestine situations in argentina and i think this is a relevant uh, case analysis because uh, we are currently living in, in specifically in the US, uh, an increasing persecution against abortion. And this implies, uh, this raises the question how can we understand this practice based on evidence rather than on personal beliefs? So, to give a little bit uh, of context, Argentina legalized abortion last year. And during this debate, one of the main arguments against uh, the legalization was that abortion causes a uh, permanent trauma and distress on the people that practice the, that takes these practices. But for this work, there was no proof. And because it was illegal, no studies were conducted at the time to understand if this was real or just a myth. So to solve this issue or to get data into the discussion, two um, feminist organizations joined forces. First, a grassroots organization of female doctors that help people that, uh, have the safest conditions when practicing abortions called La Revuelta, and a feminist organization that, among other stuff, uh, does that analysis called Economia Feminita. And I think this is really interesting because these are organizations that go beyond traditional research institutions. These are None of these are uh, labs or universities or research centers, but uh, actually we have grassroots organizations present here. And in this case, it's uh, particularly important because in a situation of clandestine, clandestinity, uh, the only way in which we can collect information about this practice is uh, building trust. And the only way, uh, and, and a grassroots organization that helped people uh, going through this situation is the only one that can build the necessary trust to gather this information. So La Revuelta made more than 400 interviews uh, where they, uh, of people that were accompanied by them. And um, one of the questions they made was, which were the principal emotions that uh, people felt after practicing the abortion? And the data shows that the, by far the most common emotion was actually relief and not anguish or guilt or sadness. So this evidence is going against this more or less generalized belief that abortion produces anguish and permanent trauma. And uh, we now realize that this was actually just an idea popularized by these anti-abortion organizations that in the case of Argentina, they are most of the times also against science itself. So now to conclude for real, uh, understudied research topics also appear in the form of missing data. And this missing data is necessary for public policy. And in order to move towards a more inclusive science, we also need to include this grassroots organization in many of our research. And to bring this uh, to the US context, I think that this rise in the laws that persecute organization that help people practice abortion will not only uh, create a more unsafe environment for the, for the people that need uh, this help, but will also restrict the possibility of further research on the topic. So thank you very, very much. Um, I'm waiting for your questions. Thank you so much, Diego. All right, turning to our questions, feel free to throw them in the chat or the Q&A. Uh, the first question came from the identification of China as a prominent topic associated uh, with the Asian classification in the data set. And the question was, does Asian, is it inclusive of South Asian? Um, if so, why do you suppose we are not seeing articles that relate to Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, um, or West Asia? So can you say a little bit about how to interpret the data that you found and, and what we see as that over dominance on China, but in, in not more inclusive topics around Asia. So uh, maybe I was not so detailed on, on that part. Thanks for, for that question. The labels that I was showing in this figure uh, are labels that we put based on the mo model that is automatically generating those topics. It's not something that we are uh, defining uh, a priori. Uh, 
But this is a model from text mining, from natural language processing, that it takes all the words that are in abstracts on the papers in Web of Science and automatically generates uh, these 200 topics, where each of these 200 topics is defined by the most common words that appear on, on the topic. And then what we did was taking these uh, top five, top 10 words on each topic to assign a label. And we only did it for a few of them that are the ones that we display on, on the figure. So we put China, but actually there are uh, maybe two or three more words. Uh, but I, as far as I remember, I did not see a uh, something related with India or Pakistan or, or other countries. It was clearly a, like the first word, the most distinctive word of the topic was that, and that's how we label it. Thank you. Um, well, I have a question while we're waiting for other ones. Both you and Danny talked about the difficulty of accurate assignment of names to black scholars, and particularly that surnames for the black community are often symbols of erasure, of ownership, even of rape. Um, can you talk a little bit about how we do this with sensitivity? Is it, you know, going back to the title of our talk, are we perpetuating some of these problematic issues by a focus on names and how do we avoid that and improve the validity of these studies? So maybe Diego first and, and maybe I'll bring in uh, Danny as well. Okay, yeah, I think that's a, a very important part of, of our analysis. Uh, actually, when we started the, the, the research, we, our first idea, the most intuitive idea was, okay, let's uh, take the thresholding, the take, let's take all those names that are clearly from a group and let's assign that label. And then we discard the rest because we cannot assign it. And then when we were doing this uh, sensitivity analysis, uh, we realized that because of the history of naming practices and because of uh, the history of slavery in the US and how uh, the slave owners were uh, assigning these names to the black population and the African-American population, uh, this implies that because there is a higher proportion of white population, most of the black population was gonna be under um, like this card or was gonna be assigned as a white population. Uh, so we were heavily going to we're going to underestimate this population, and we realized that the only way to to partially solve this issue is to use this uh, full distribution. But I think maybe it's it's not a perfect solution, uh, but uh, I mean clearly this is. A problem that maybe it's, it's impossible uh, to perfectly solve without a, a survey and people self-identifying uh, from a specific group. But uh, we saw that there were many uh, research and our first idea was to use this thresholding that was going to completely uh, disappear this part of the population. And actually, I was very happy to see that in Danny's work, uh, they were not using the thresholding as well. Danny, do you want to jump in on that? Yeah, um, I think that I think that it's a really important point, and I think it makes me go back to the one of the earlier questions, which is, what are the different ways in which bias can um, creep in? And I think that one of the ways that bias can creep in is by the um, name that we see when we search on Google Scholar for a paper about this particular topic. And we see a name and it looks of this particular race or ethnicity and we say, oh, because it's that race or ethnicity, I'm gonna read the paper. If it's a different one, I wouldn't. Obviously, I hope I never do that, but that's the way bias can creep in according to name. And in that case, somebody who has a very clearly um, African name will be more impacted by the name-based bias than somebody who does not have a clearly African name. However, bias comes in in other ways. Bias comes in in who we saw at the conference, in, in how somebody appears. Um, and so when it's, when it's those kinds of effects, then obviously um, the, the, the estimates that we have from the names is not going to be enough to capture that. So I, when I think about the data that we showed, I think that you know there's definitely a group of black people who are in the white group. Um, and that means that the, the actual true citation gap 
is probably a lot bigger than what we estimated. It's probably the the story is probably worse and 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 more upsetting um, than what we showed. So I think what we have is an underestimation of what's actually going on rather than a true estimation. Um, so I'd love to be able to do it uh, better, but I do agree that um, for I think that this is this should be a close to accurate assessment of name based bias, um, but it's not going to be an accurate assessment of the bias that comes in when we perceive one another. Following up on that question, and both of you referenced it in your answer, is that use of a fractionalized rather than a threshold approach. Um, could you say just a little bit more about that, um, both in how we conceptualize that, but then how we interpret that. And, and to be more specific, uh, many times when talking about this work, people will say, but you classified me wrong, right? Taking it to the individual level. Um, can you say a little bit about what a policymaker can do when interpreting fractionalized results and fractionalized reporting um, over these data? Danny, do you wanna start and then Diego? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, so the goal is to report global effects, large scale effects um, that are going to be true on the average and not necessarily true for a single individual. Um, so I think that policies that focus on the on these broad effects and then have mitigation strategies that are that are global rather than specific is going is going to be important. I think that how how we specific your but your more specific question is how do we think about the the fractional nature of the predictions. And I think particularly when you're using um, first name and last name, you can have a last name that has um, one predicted ethnicity or race and a first name that has a very different predicted ethnicity and race. And that, that can actually be indicative of the fact that that person comes from a multiracial family. And this is actually their heritage. They have more than one. Um, and so that's, I think, something that's that's a benefit of the probabilistic assignments and, and these sort of the fractional nature of the prediction that we can go beyond um, single bins uh, and, and therefore get a, get a much better um, understanding of, of the more complex um, racial and ethnic history of the, of the individual based on, on their names. But Diego, do you have other thoughts? Yeah, I think this is uh, a really good question. I think there are, uh, in, in this context, two, two different issues. One uh, is related also with the previous question, uh, and because there is a lot of overlapping in the names of the black and white population, when we use the fractional counting, we are going to be overlap a lot uh, these groups, and that's uh, maybe why uh, there are some results that they, where they seem really similar, and actually it's just a, a sort of misclassification, or as Danny was saying, things are probably even more uh, segregated and, and worse. Uh, but the second thing specifically related with this individual classification, I think it's rather good. Actually, I think it's a benefit not to be able to have an individual level classification. And maybe the, the math, it's a little more complex when we always have to deal with a, a new distribution on top of other distributions rather than just a, a single category. But I think it's it's really good. And actually, uh, the other day, um, I was contacted by someone from a firm. I think I don't understand uh, these names of, of companies, but, but they were something of assessing debts or something like this. And they were using a, a, a they, the, this guy approached me saying, OK, we want to unbias our models because we are inferring this and we and he was like trying to uh, seemingly to do something that was positive. Uh, but then he was asking me, how can we use this model? Because uh, it cannot work on individual level. And I was like, really happy to say, yes, if you want unbiased results, then you can use this to uh, assess your system and see which is the level of, of uh, segregation and bias in your results and how much you are uh, uh, complicating lives of people that uh, is a black, Latino, or, or Asian, uh, but you are not going to be able to assign this individual that you want to assess and you want to put the, I don't know, the interest rate on their debt uh, to a specific racial group. And that's really good because they should not do that. They should be able to account the bias in their models, but they should not be able to have this as a parameter for the models because it's, it's really dangerous and it's really it would be awful to, to, to bring this tool. So if we are doing research that needs to develop these tools and this is published and this is also used by maybe private companies or, or 
I don't know, other, other people. Uh, it's very good that our models are, uh, our conclusion is that you will never be able to do individual level classification. That's a fantastic story, Diego. Um, Danny, you use the word global. So I'd like to go to Mila Kishko's question about white names being synonymous with Anglo names and maybe even break this question open a bit more to talk about many of the other ethnicity classification algorithms that are out there um, on the market and being used in research right now. Um, of course, both of you were focusing within a US context with the classification set by uh, the US census where white includes Middle Eastern, it includes people from uh, British colonies. It's, you know, there is a different level that we are inclusive in white in this country that doesn't apply to every country uh, necessarily. But can you say a little bit about the global application of these kinds of algorithms? How might we do or should we do ethnicity uh, disambiguation beyond the confines of a single country and their census classifications? Yeah, I think so in the work that that we did, um, white does not necessarily just mean Anglo. So it does include other nationalities in Europe. Um, and uh, but I, I think the broader question of how to, how to potentially do ethnicity disambiguation across um, a wider group of, of cultures that may not you know, be, be directly from the particular focus that we had. I do think Wikipedia remains a really good place to be doing, to be building some of these algorithms. And I think that that motivates perhaps just increasing commitment to um, to expanding Wikipedia as a, as a place to be generating the data on which these kinds of algorithms could be trained um, appropriately. That's that's my um, feeling that that's, that's an, an opportunity, a place for the work to go. I don't know, Diego, what do you think? I, I have a little conflict with that, honestly, because I don't think racial categories make sense uh, uniformly in, in all countries. I think they are uh, really a cultural uh, construct that it's really country dependent and they won't make this uh, any sense. And I mean, maybe white is uh, because white people invade almost all the world. This is more or less a general category, uh, but beyond that, but as Cassidy was saying, white in US is not the same as white in, in other countries. And also I think Specifically, I mean, the case of the Latinx population, it's, it's very clear that in Latin America, it won't make sense as a racial category. And so I think that if we want to move to a more general, I, I don't think we can move to a more generalistic approach, but rather we could do something like a multinational case analysis and, and study each and a country as uh, by its historical uh, development and their historical construct of race. And we have to rethink, I guess, uh, this uh, assignation of, of uh, racial categories in each country in particular, or maybe regions. Maybe Europe has a similar, shares a similar concept uh, and construct of race, and maybe Latin America has a similar um, construct of what race is, where we definitely have to include the um, Native American population, which, by the way, it was a limitation of our work. We cannot include it in, in the, all the research that I was showing because uh, of statistical issues. Uh, but for example, in Brazil, in Bolivia, these are countries where there is a large proportion of the population is Latin American, Latin American and this necessarily has to be a category. And the same uh, in all different regions of the world, we have to first of all, be very critical and, and, and really study the, the history of these places and how the cultural co the construct of race is built in each place, how the naming practices are built in each place. And from there, we can start to, to build this more global analysis. Thank you. I wanna to return to a comment that Carol Lee made in the discussion, um, quoting Danny from your Nature Neuroscience paper about the limitations in these tools, particularly around the binary classification of gender. And in your talk and your opening slide, you talked about hoping to expand our analysis um, to be more inclusive of more genders. Uh, can you say maybe a little bit about this line of research and how we could go about that? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, so obviously one way that we could do this is to have more um, collaborate with institutions that have access to self self identification data. So for example, I know that john Freeman at New York University is um, being a, really a strong advocate and activist for having people uh, um, able to self identify their gender and sexual orientation or and several other um, kinds of variables it, when they apply for um, National Science Foundation grants, because he 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 claims that, you know, and I think rightly, if we do not collect that kind of data, we will not be able to evaluate where um, bias and discrimination is occurring. And so he's, and obviously it would be optional, um, but he's, he would like to have the opportunity for people uh, to self-identify if they wish to, um, and that would support this kind of work. Um, the, the second thing I guess I wanted to mention is that in our approaches, not to doing the science, um, but to addressing the, this kind of bias that might creep into our own reference lists, we have done um, kind of the very slow uh, approach, which is to look up every single paper that we cite, look up the, in, the first author, look up the last author, if we don't already know them, look up what um, pronouns we see on their website, um, and then uh, so that allows us to, you know, include people who are um, non-binary and identify for at least for those who are out anyway, uh, out publicly. Um, the second thing that we do is that we use um, 500QueerScientists.org, which is a wonderful organization that has um, life stories uh, uh, of individuals who are from the LGBTQ plus community in the sciences. And so we also look up each of the person's names in that um, in that database as well to see whether um, they are out as trans or non-binary there. Um, and then lastly, what we do is take it upon ourselves to, um, you know, take the responsibility of um, knowing more people, um, noticing the flags they fly on Twitter, for example, um, and then uh, incorporating that into our memories, not just forgetting it immediately, um, understanding the kind of work that they do um, and asking ourselves frequently whether that work is, is relevant to what we are doing and, and deserves to be cited. So those are more on the, the personal mitigation strategies um, rather than the, the, the science part, but I think that's equally important here. To go on that a little bit more, I want to ask sort of two questions. So Diego talked about um, these statistical necessities leading to exclusions of certain population from the research. And as meta scientists, as those of us who use very large scale or quantitative approaches to analyzing science, we're often reverting to tools um, that force us to exclude certain populations when they don't meet a size threshold. Um, so for Danny, you know, your comments about increasing the genders, um, sort of two questions. How do we avoid collecting those data only to exclude them, given the kinds of tools that we use, or including them at the risk of violating identification and privacy and other human ethics responsibilities that we have as scientists? So how do we value making visible those who are invisible without um, making them more vulnerable? Yeah, I think this is so incredibly important. Um, and I think that, you know, all of the work that we've been doing is in collaboration with, like on our team, there are there is not a trans scholar and there's a non-binary scholar. And so we've been in conversation about how to do this well, not that we know, um, you know, not that we are a voice for everyone, but it is something that's very present in our conversations. And I think that, um, I think that there are, there's been a little bit of pushback even to say, well, even if you go onto web pages and see somebody's pronouns, it might be the pronouns that they feel safe using there, um, and they may use a very different set of pronouns elsewhere, or um, the trans person, this particular one doesn't want to be known as trans, wants to be known as man or woman, um, and that's up to them, and it shouldn't be really anybody's business to, to do otherwise. So I think 
I think it's something that needs to be done with with a lot of care and a lot of respect and um, a lot of collaboration, I think, with the communities uh, that are involved and really understanding what is important to them and how to do the research in a way uh, that supports them and 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 is valued by them, that they feel that they get something out of it. Um, so I think this motivates, you know, community partnership based research. It's not, you know, one group studying another, it is what is the kind of work that we could do together that would help, um, that would make everybody happier, um, that would really has something to offer them, um, not just as an object of study. Diego, do you wanna add anything on that? Um, no, I just uh, want to uh, reinforce what the, the last part. I think uh, working with communities is the most important and uh, organizations need to be involved in, in specifically in this type of, uh, of analysis. Uh, and maybe it's, it's not as simple as, uh, as we do when we take this large scale bibliometric analysis and we just use a algorithm to infer uh, things, uh, but rather on survey base, which are also are very valuable. And also we have to always, when we are working with this smaller scale data, we have always to be careful not to uh, show, like not to be, um, how to say, a non anonymized uh, the information. But when we work with communities, with grassroots organizations, with uh, people that has an interest in, in improvement of, of these groups, I think uh, it can always uh, be for the benefit. Perfect. I want to turn to a couple of questions on citations themselves. Um, so first, I want to ask you, uh, Danny, a sort of a general question, and then we're going to go to Elizabeth Butler's question. You talked about moving um, from a mythology of the history as evidenced by citations to a history. Um, so how do we get from a uh, to the, or is that a mythology that we should do away from completely? And on that, right, the mythology of the meritocracy of citations, but both of you have utilized citations in your work. So how do we both critique citations, but also utilize them in these studies um, is sort of one question. And the second part of that question um, is one of your recommended policy suggestions is actually to go and look up and to understand how you're citing. So as a devil's advocate, does that not introduce more bias um, to be hyper aware of race and gender when doing citations? And does that lead to even more pervasive kinds of inequities? Um, maybe your last question first. So does looking up um, individuals uh, create greater inequities because it's, it's foregrounding gender and race in our heads? I think the answer is no, because I think the what we are all doing is coming from a place of bias. And I think that our our default is that we need to overcome that within each of each of ours, where it's it's part of our culture, it's part of society, it's part of who we've been exposed to in textbooks, at conferences, it's everywhere. And so I think that we should be very, very um, committed to re-educating ourselves. So I do not see that as a, as a negative um, activity. I see that as a necessary activity given where we are. Um, maybe in some future state will be, it'll be different, but I don't see that as now. Um, and so then the question is um, citations as a meritocracy versus, you know, and, and, and shouldn't it not be about citations? Yes, it should absolutely not be about citations. People should not be, um, uh, uh, promoted because of their citations. However, it happens all the time. And because it happens, if you, if you want to address the now of society, then you need to be able to do work that shows that that method of evaluating the merit of a scholar is wrong. It's, 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 it's in, not an accurate reflection of um, the merit of their work. So I think I think you have to answer today's society with the way today's society is working in still with the hope, obviously, of changing for a new society in the future. Um, but then your first question um, was about, oh gosh, working memory, three questions back. Um, 
a history to the history. Oh, thank you, thank you. But that was um, an impressive recall for the first two, frankly. Okay. Uh, the so a history to the history. So I I've actually just begun begun reading this um, book by Patricia Hill Collins, who's a fantastic um, scholar in at, who just retired from University of Maryland. Um, and she wrote this book called Intersectionality as Critical Social Theory. Um, and in that book, she has just an, an amazing sort of take on resistant knowledges, which is the kind of knowledges that um, oppressed um, or subjugated individuals create over, over history and how that knowledge is important and, and not available elsewhere. And I think about that a lot in the context of citations, that I think that there are whole areas of science that have been under utilized in the direction of, of scientific progress simply because of the demographics of the individual scholar involved. Um, and so that makes me think that, you know, the well, it makes me want a different future for us. It makes me want a future in which all questions are valued and in which science does not narrow constantly um, by the demographics or the seniority or the citation counts of the people involved, but is constantly freed from those and really um, explores the space of questions that are available. Um, I think that we could make so much faster progress. I think that discoveries would happen so much more quickly if um, we, we freed inquiry from these kind of blinders that we have on. Um, so it is, it is, I want a new history. Fantastic. Diego? Um, two, two things. Um, first, with, with respect of citations and how uh, influenced shall they are on, on people's career, I think also this type of work is very important to demystify uh, the meritocracy myth of, of related with citations, because if we can clearly show that citations are biased by race and gender, there uh, this idea of, well, we are just promoting people that gets, gets more citations is clearly uh, more in trouble. I think this is, even though maybe in, in the bibliometricians communities, the idea of more citations as a better work is not so common nowadays, and we, we discuss a lot about that. I think outside <laughs> in, in the general uh, community of science, this it is still there and, and pretty much strong. And I think that's why also so important to show this, this type of analysis to, to show that this is actually full of other stuff and a uh, history full of uh, discrimination, full of uh, sexism. And um, with respect of whether we should check uh, race and gender or uh, gender identity in, in our references, I think it's a really interesting uh, thing to do. I think I will do it for, for my papers to see what, what I'm doing. I think it's a really interesting self-reflection on our own biases. I would not be so uh, positive on having something like an automatic way of doing this and like, uh, automatically showing it to everybody that because that might uh, introduce uh, reinforce biases for some people that uh, is not thinking about these issues but if uh, i mean if this is a tool I, I will really really want to check out that that package and i think for the people that is concerned about their own biases and how can we uh, deconstruct them i think it's great but if we do this, I think this it's the type of things that when we go on a large scale automatic uh, thing, then it can uh, bring more problems than what it can help. Thank you. Now from Elizabeth Butler, do you have a sense if the increasing under citation is indicative of a larger number of papers written by women, but the same small group is being cited? Or is it a stronger and stronger tendency, for example, to feeling infringed upon or internalized bias? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, in our data, what we find is that people seem to be citing like it's 1995. It's a great title for a, a song, right? Um, but yeah, so they're citing like it's 1995 and they've done that since 90, 1995. But what's happened obviously in the last 25 years is that the demographics of um, the academy has changed significantly and the number of papers that are being written um, by marginalized groups has increased. And so um, that means that the citation gap grows, 
All right, let's turn to sort of what we do now. So we see a message from Carol Lee saying, I'd love to have the opportunity to self-identify when updating my ORCID ID information or via some other cross-organization database associated with publishing. Are there any efforts to make progress on this front? I did not think of ORCID ID, that's a great idea. Um, I don't know, I will, I could ping, uh, again, I feel like um, John Freeman is the one who I would ask if, if something has been done in that space yet. Um, I can check. It's a great idea. And then more generally, how do we get from these descriptions to science policy? How do we change? And at what levels should we change? What are the sort of lowest hanging fruits of what we can do next? And um, sort of how do how do we get to the that future that we want to, that new history that Danny wants to write? Diego, do you want to go first? Okay. Um, I, I think for from our research, I would say um, there are two main uh, ideas that I, I can, uh, as a conclusion, and it's related with these research topics. And we have these highly cited research topics that are more popular and where white men are the uh, overrepresented. They are always the majority. It's uh, there is a general overrepresentation, but in those uh, let's say hot topics, they are we are even more uh, overrepresented. And uh, I think for those, uh, the policy should be to try to diversify them and to include uh, marginalized groups, but always taking into account that uh, this can also be more hostile environments, and it's not just a matter of throwing people into uh, a place of, of hostility and violence. And also this should be taken into account when diversifying uh, these, these places. And um, also the, the, I think the most impactful conclusion is that there are understudied topics and they are uh, always related with the topics that are more, most relevant to marginalized groups. And I think uh, we need to fund them. We need to uh, promote the research on those marginalized fields, marginalized topics. And this is not only uh, for marginalized population, but for everybody that wants to do research, because that's kind of the urgent thing to do. We have less knowledge that we should as a society on several topics. And there are several, several examples in, in health on this. Uh, and that's like a really urgent thing to, to do also. Thank you, Danny. Um, yeah, I think that um, one, I, I think that it's important definitely to increase representation, but I also think that it's important to um, increase engagement. So what we see in our data is that even though there's an increased representation over time, both in terms of race and in terms of gender, um, there is decrementing engagement. Um, so there's something there's something that needs to happen in terms of engagement. And I'm uh, to the degree that I, I notice that, that we notice that this is related to social networks. I feel like a lot of um, it could it could be that uh, providing more places maybe for funding for diverse teams to grow those social networks to grow those collaboration networks would be important. That might be something that would that would help um, alter. Uh, you know the the demographics are what they are right now. If we just take them as they are, that would that could change engagement. I think, um, but I think it's. Yeah, the maybe the last piece of data that I didn't show, but that we have um, is that for journals, um, if they the journals that do publish more papers from diverse groups, so if their author pool is diverse, that journals citation practices also are diverse. Um, so I wonder too, if there's in terms of policy, I'm thinking like kind of lower tier, like journal policy, um, is, is there more that journals could do to ensure the diversity of their author pool, maybe by um, invited pieces um, or other avenues that they have available to them. And potentially that would be able to turn it around a little bit. Perfect. Well, I am going to ask for your concluding thoughts and I'll sort of give one anchoring question, but feel free to, to share 
sort of what you think are the key takeaways you would like for this community to have. But for this community of meta science researchers, um, what would you give as one key takeaway or piece of advice for them? And any just last concluding words you have to say on this topic? Um, maybe we'll start with Danny and then with Diego. Yeah, I think I would probably underscore the importance of um, collaborating with people across different um, domains of expertise in this space. I think that collaborating with people who have expertise in gender theory and race theory, the people who have expertise in intersectionality, who have worked on kind of the history of these problems um, for so long, I think that uh, they have that combining those perspectives and that knowledge with science, you have to grapple with a lot of hard problems at that intersection, but I think that's really where we'll hopefully be able to do the work that is most meaningful um, to society and most um, carefully crafted and, and carefully interpreted. Um, so I guess, I guess that's what I would emphasize is just that I've certainly learned so much through this process, mostly by the, the collaboration with people very far from um, scientific fields. Fantastic, Diego. So at the beginning of, of my presentation, I quoted Suveri, and I would like to do some kind of rephrase a lot of that uh, quote. And I think our research in, in meta science can be an artifact of both the struggles to preserve society as it is or transform it, uh, transforming society in a positive way. And it, this is really, it, it's related with how much uh, we are um, considering the historical context of our analysis, how much we are considering the missing data, how much we are considering the missing research topics and the marginalized groups, the uh, people with which we are working with, the, and, and all of these factors, maybe we are not going to be, uh, like th this doesn't guarantee anything, but I think this really uh, increase the chances of our work being meaningful to have a positive impact on our society, or to uh, have a, actually a pervasive uh, impact. And I think in meta science, uh, we have also this uh, struggle of what our work uh, going to, to point to. And also consider that our research is not always, um, like it's, it's not only upon our free will of what we want to do, but it's related with uh, race in, in, in academy for academic capital or the impact factor race or the impact metrics race. And we are also all of, uh, of us uh, f following uh, that and our research is, is determined by, by this. So um, it's also, it's, it's par partially a matter of us taking the role of, of understanding the context in which we are doing research, but also uh, trying to improve the institutions in research to, to make all, all these, um, how do you say, all these uh, tendencies, all these uh, conditions on our research to, to try to make things positive. Thank you. Wonderful last words. Um, well, I just want to thank our presenters for their labor here today. I know this was a very long panel and you withstood all of the questions very well. Um, and thank our audience for engaging um, so robustly. I really do hope that this serves as a catalyst for future conversations. I know that both of, of these authors are very open in their scientific practices. So if you have questions about data, about approaches, about methods, about tools, please um, do contact them and let's keep this conversation going. Now it's three minutes till midnight here and I'm gonna turn into a pumpkin. So I think it's a good time to, to say goodbye. So thank you and have a good night. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye.